my name is Julie Ann Peterson, and I am your host tonight for Zoom at 8. I am also the Senior Director at Old Capital Lending, and we are specialists in multifamily. Now, we will look at other asset classes, but we really are specialists in multifamily. We've closed 6,500 loans. And if you're looking at other lenders, that is a lot of loans. So, you know, it is about a track record. It is about relationships. And Old Capital has done a great job um, providing debt for so many, so many deals. So if you're looking at something, love to have the opportunity. The rates are going up tomorrow. In fact, so far, we're looking at 50 BIPs. I bet tomorrow we've got a meeting. I already have one of my lenders already knows that they're raising at 50 bips. So you want to kind of check in with your lender before you put in an LOI, make sure that it still works. And by the way, I'm hearing lots of deals are closing, or people are walking away from them. Last week, I closed a deal. If you didn't see it on, uh, on Facebook or, or LinkedIn, 81% on an agency loan. That has not happened in a very long time. I think I'm the only one at Old Capital that was able to get it done. So don't walk away from the agencies. Many of these agency deals are coming in at 50 or 60%, but there are some that are priced just right for what the income is bringing in, the, the properties bringing in income wise. So don't, don't get concerned, bring it to us, let us look at it. now. Every Tuesday night, we are here, we're learning, and we're networking. Three nights out of the month, uh, three Tuesdays out of the month, we're, we've got a professional, somebody who is doing business in multifamily, and they're here to talk about it. And tonight, we're excited. Charles Lemire is here. You guys are up for something special. This guy, you will never forget. So um, thinking about limited partnerships. Tonight is the night to be here dialing in and seeing how do, do people look at these deals. All right. Well, the time has come. We are here tonight to visit with Charles Lemire, and it is going to be like no other night because Charles, he's pretty special, you guys. He is an electrical engineer by degree. He also has an MSE and an MBA. In the middle of college, he spent a short period of time in the Air Force and even took some investing in business courses then. Clearly, he is a pro, a pro for education and a bit of a nerd. Those are his words, not mine. Charles worked at Texas Instruments for 20 years. And at the age of 56, with no prior involvement in real estate, his wife dragged him to a real estate investing meeting in which both single and multifamily were being discussed and he found multifamily syndication to be very, very interesting. So he and his wife became students of uh, multifamily syndication immediately after that meeting. So he couldn't decide, should he be a lead, a general partner, or should he be passive? That was his question. So in 12 years of their multifamily journey, Charles and Gayla, his wife, have entered 63 syndications. That is a lot. Um, three of them are, are still pending, uh, purchase, being purchased. So 30 of them have been sold. So he's got three that are queued up and will be selling this month or next. So right now, he is currently holding on to 30 investments at this time as a limited partner. Man, oh man, I'm excited to hear about this. He is now, he, he, he really sees this as a lucrative hobby and it allows him a lot of other interests. Um, and, and he also meets up with a lot of interesting people. So he has invested or he is currently invested in Alabama, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, Ohio, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and te Texas. That's about 8,800 total doors. And right now he's got about 5,000 doors. My oh my, it's going to be an amazing uh, conversation. So 
Charles, welcome to Zoom at 8. I know you've been here before, but not as a speaker. So I welcome you to tonight. And listen, I want everybody to look at, at uh, Charles in his eyes. So go over to the right-hand side of your screen. And there's some little squares. Make it him the speaker so you can give him all your attention. And once he says hello, we're going to see him right in front of us. Charles, say hello. Hello. There he is. Don't break your camera by focusing <laughs> on me. Uh, and, and I want to say that I, I am proud that you got all of those uh, state codes, you know, the, the, uh, the two-letter codes. Back when I was a kid, it was TNN for Tennessee rather than that TN that they do today, you know? Right, yeah. Strange. You know, as I was going through that, I, I was thinking, man, oh man, my kids have really helped me go, get through all of those, those different, okay. different places. So listen, I'm excited to have you on here. I've known you for probably four years. I've been watching you. I've seen you around a lot of the conferences. You kind of stand in the back, you take everything in. And once you, we, we've engaged, you are such uh, a wealth of knowledge and you have an opinion which I always love. I'd rather have a black and white than just gray. And Charles, you have an opinion. So I, I love that about you. Um, I, I'm curious, I've got a lineup of questions mm -hmm. and I, I'd love to go through them with you. Go for it. So, you know, I, I'm wondering, um, how you, we talk about your wife putting you, getting you in front of, uh, you know, this investing community you were doing nothing before. What was it that got you to think I can do this and what keeps you involved today? Uh, I have always been a squirrel, so I save money. And I apologize for going long, but I never answer a short answer from a long question or either way. Mm -hmm. So we had some money. Uh, I've always saved it up and we had it, um, you know, most people were going all retirement but I recognized with RMDs off in the future, that was a really bad idea. So we started saving outside of our uh, retirement. So we had actual cash. And I have invested in all manner of things over time, usually just a little bit at a time to see how bad it is. Uh, I did life settlements. I'm still paying the price for that one. I don't think I'll lose anything, but I don't know that I'll make anything. I've done different accounts in the stock market. I'm still in the stock market that, you know, sue me if that's bad, but I, I still stay there. And yes, I am down, but we've done different things over time. So I've always been uh, wanting to do different things. And when Gala dragged me, and I mean, kicking and screaming to, um, it was lifestyles. I hope I can say that, but uh, oh, yeah. into lifestyles, you know, it was, if you've ever seen the movie, The Sting, it was a sting moment. I counted the people in the room, took the amount of money they wanted from me and said, nope, they would not be doing this just to steal this much money. It wouldn't be worth it to them. And so that's when we went forward. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, completely disbelievable. So at that point, we then signed up for the, the weekend. Uh, the dude, Brad Sumrock, I don't know if anybody knows him. He is our current mentor even today, but he gave the presentation and he went all over the single family stuff, which I really had very little interest in on Saturday. Sunday morning, he kicked off on how to pay my bills. I've never had bills, so this was sort of foreign to me, but I thought it was interesting. And then uh, he went into multifamily. And when he started going through the things, I started saying, this, this has promise. I asked question after question. I ticked him off so badly. He just, uh, he hated me for months <laughs> after that. And um we started, I said, this will work. And so we started looking around, we found the lead, got to a deal and was actually a KP on the first deal. And then we started doing them one after the other. After that, we had enough to uh, do, I think three deals the first year. Uh, that would have been 11. We went to the, the, the lifestyles at first in 10. Uh, for the next three, four months, we watched their videos on training every night for dinner multiple times because I, I'm, I'm nerdy. I wanted to understand every bit and piece of this thing. And so then we, uh, we, we got into this thing and I asked tons of questions to the lead on this deal. Uh, that deal was not one of the best deals I've ever gotten into, but we did okay. Um, it's a long story with that one, but it was a very good training exercise. And I, I took it as the 
the uh, chance to learn even more. All the things that went wrong were just opportunities to learn something and being reasonably well-trained and understanding how all this stuff worked. You know, if something goes wrong, you just work the problem and move on. So it was good that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, there are lots of different education programs out there, right? And you oh, yeah. need to choose one that is best for you, right? Uh, lifestyles, you know, Brad Sumrock, he was there for nine years, left there and started his own program. So mm -hmm. you followed him, right? Yes. Uh, at what Did you follow him right as he started his own business then? Yes. As a matter of fact, we, he wow. consulted with us. Uh, my wife is pretty good looking and I don't think he wanted me to help, but he wanted her in the booth. So he asked us to uh, help him. He knew that she worked for American. And so we would fly to different cities while he did uh, different conferences. We went to LA twice, went to Washington oh. one time, uh, Baltimore one time. I believe it was Baltimore. It could have been Philadelphia. I get confused. Anyway, and then we went to Chicago a couple of times, and they had a few of them here in Dallas. But we would go in and, and work the booths and just support him on that thing and became, you know, good friends. He makes a lot more money now, so we, we've lost, uh, you know, that kind of connection. But it was a, a good time. And, you know, he, he complimented. He says, why aren't you a lead? And, you know, it's the, the and I think that's going to be one of your questions. But essentially, I had a job I enjoyed foolishly if you want to think of it that way or great if you don't but um i didn't feel i should take on people's money and put their money at risk when i really wasn't in a position to drop everything and go work on a property if something went wrong and so i stayed as an lp and you know if you have some funds and you can invest you can make enough money as an lp to move on with and so i don't make the big kick as the you know the 100 percent or thousand percent or infinite percent on you know other people's money but i make plenty of money on my money and so we've done fairly well at it and i don't live extravagantly so i'm fine with this and then when i finally retired we were making enough um so much more than i ever made as a salary that i said no i'm not i'm not going to waste my time doing that we're going to either travel that didn't work too well. There was a couple of years of COVID, but you know, hey, mm -hmm. you can't have everything. But we did drive uh, Route 66 in 19. Um, we were both 66 years old, so it was sort of momentous for us at that point. And then we, uh, I was on both coasts, drove all the way across the country like three times that year for different reasons. We had a wedding in the east and a Christmas party in the west and stuff like that. So it was a it was a fun time. And then, so it allowed you a yeah. lot of flexibility. Oh yeah. So. I, yeah, I, I, I'm curious. So a lot of people say I'm going to be in a in a education program and then I'm going to get educated, educated. I'm going to meet all these people and then I'm going to drop out. That has not been your the way that you have managed your education. You continue to be part of an education program, Yes. which I think is really cool. Can you tell us a little bit about what you look for? in a coach well, that you continue to stay as a, as a uh, student? Uh, well, I, I'm not here to advertise for Brad. And there sure. are many people that do a lot of different uh, programs and things like that. And I always, when I'm telling people, none of them are charities. So they do charge you money. But in our case, I feel very beholding to Brad because he's done us very well. You know, and I guess if I had been um, a lead, he'd have done us even better. But Personally, I'm very happy where we are, um, and I so I, I go and I work the volunteer at all of his events as if I'm in town, and through that method, I meet a whole lot of people who are coming through here, so I'm finding new leads mm -hmm. with which to invest, and so I'm meeting people at these events. I talk to them, and I feel very good about sharing the knowledge of how it works. Uh, let's say that on the stage, there might be a sales motive behind a lot of stuff that goes on, but I never have that. I'm always going to tell you what I think is the truth straight down the middle. And, you know, people will walk away with it from it and they'll go, oh, that's not possible. You can't make that kind of money. I have a sheet and I say, here's what I've done. Here are my, you know, I got some checks in the back just to prove it. I, you know, it has been wonderful for us. Uh, but, you know, everybody's mileage may vary. But it, it is some people take a little bit of a kick to do it. And I don't mind sharing that kind of information. And I don't mind sharing um, how things work and do that. And I meet with people 
probably one every two weeks, maybe a little bit more than that. And I'll either have a lunch with them, talk to them on a phone, something like that, talking them through how to do this stuff. I meet people on bigger pockets and I offer, you know, spend an hour to answer those dumb questions that you'll be embarrassed to answer uh, or ask and, and just give you a straight answer on how it all works. I enjoy doing that. Uh, you know, maybe hard of a teacher, something like that, but I really enjoy helping people up. And, and it's not unlike skiing. I'm a really poor skier. Uh, and that was years ago. I'm way past that now. My expiration date on skiing is long past, <laughs> but I can help a person get to be a beginner really well. Past that, uh, they're on their own. But, uh, you know, so I can help a person be an LP and, and I can tell them a lot of stuff about being a, a GP, but, you know, I can get someone to start or from start to a good start going. Um, and I enjoy it. You know, I, I want to kind of talk about, um, you had mentioned something that I thought was really interesting that you choose to stay in the group to be part of their, uh, their education program because you know exactly how it's gonna be underwritten. You've become yes. very familiar with the, uh, the model, the underwriting tool, and you have expectations that they always are following the rules. I think that is a really amazing statement and makes a lot of sense. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Uh, well, again, not to advertise, but I'm advertising. But, you know, Brad has a, an analysis sheet underwriting. And in that analysis sheet, everybody in that program, uh, all of the leads are going to be his mentor, mentee students, if it's a Brad Sumrock deal, quote. And, and it doesn't say that he's saying you'll make money, but he's saying that they didn't do anything really stupid on their uh, underwriting. But it's going to be on the same sheet. So I know exactly where to look to see what kind of assumptions they're making. And I'm going like, no way, Jose, that's a really dumb thing. Or, you know, you can, you can look at it and see those things that I want to see or see those things that I don't want to see. And I can tell if I want to be in it or not, but I know how they were trained. I know uh, I've met them. I've, uh, I also enjoy only doing Bs. I've done a couple of Cs. I don't like it. And by that, I'm talking about 506B, 506C, but I enjoy having the relationship with the person, not just, you know, someone from afar where I'm sending them money. It is so much more important to me to see someone shake their hand, look at their face, see that they're honest. And I'm always meeting people and learning their backgrounds. You know, if a guy's a banker, he's got a little bit of a plus sign in my mind. You know, and if a guy, well, some people come in with less talents and capabilities than others, and they would be lower on my list, as it were, but not necessarily off. You know, I, I did a deal with uh, a couple of guys who they were not exactly down and out, but they didn't have a lot of money, but they, you know, they had a lot of heart and they had mm -hmm. one co, uh, co GP on the deal who had some money, but they were going to work the deal for him and they did a wonderful job, you know, but I also kept in touch with them the whole time and we would exchange emails regularly. And I've been on a deal where they, you know, the guys told me to take a hike and it didn't do as well in my <laughs> opinion. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, sometimes you know, I have enough experience that sometimes I actually add some piece of positive information, but I am sort of weird being the GP with this many deals and this many, this much experience. But anyway, but I do so, like meeting new people inside Brad's group and I'm old, you know, so this is my adult socialization too. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, now, listen, you've done so many deals outside of the great state of Texas. Many people, especially in some of these um, education programs, they like to stay in their certain lane, whether it's Texas or whether it's the East Coast. You have been doing deals outside of the state for quite some time. What do you do? You have any risk tolerance? Do you have any love for certain areas? What are you looking for that? that makes you feel secure in going outside of Texas? We have, you know, we're only gonna to go to places where you're landlord friendly. So there is a huge yeah. piece of that. We're, we're gonna to go to uh, preferably to places that are tax friendly, unlike Texas, I might say. But yeah. so you, you have, Texas is a great place to invest, but it's not a perfect place to invest. So you got these others right now. Uh, most recently, we've gotten into Tennessee, and I like Tennessee. It's home, so there is something to be said for that. And when they talk about how, you know, this part of the city is that, and this part of the city is those, I'm going like, yeah, right, I know better than that. So it is interesting when they when they present 
you know, different facets that I'm already aware of. And I know more about the city than perhaps the leads that live out of town, but they do have an in-town guy. It's, it is important to have boots on the ground somewhere near the, the actual apartment. But I, I, you know, I see their underwriting. The deal makes sense to me. Um, I will pick on, on one guy. He was going to do student housing. And I looked at that and I said, no, ain't happening. So, you know, it's just, I didn't like that particular deal and it was in Texas, but I'm just not going there. It, it didn't look like a wise way to run the business. And by the way, it didn't do very well. Uh, there's another deal that, that is probably going to do just wonderfully. It's up in Cleveland and it's a, it's a marvelous looking building, but I'm, I'm a suburban kind of guy. I just can't handle the idea of living inside of uh, 550 square feet and not having access to a car or a place to park it. That just is so, so odd to me. I just couldn't get in on that deal. They'll probably make a lot of money, but I just don't know that. So, you know, different things, it, it has to be something I'm comfortable with. And, and I've made mistakes. I've, I've had, uh, I'm going to say five dogs out of the 60, uh, 63 deals so far. So, you know, you can't win them all. So uh, one question on the underwriting model. I know we talked about that you like Brad's. Have you looked at other ask, uh have people brought deals to you that are not in Brad's group that you would yeah. use another model? And then yeah, do you? I, I do. And okay. it's a struggle to find the information that I'm, I'm looking for. Not a, not a big problem. And some of them, uh, one group, they didn't think it was important enough to stick as much information in there as Brad's does. And I was like, well, that's really cool. And then today I had lunch with a fellow who's trying to become a GP and he had a, a, a faux presentation and he was saying, I want you to pick it apart. And I did. Mm. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of stuff just left out of it kind of thing. And, and he's new. He's just trying out. So it wasn't a big problem there. But uh, I've looked through them and found uh, issues with PPMs where, well, they just make mistakes in their PPM. Or I've looked through and um, the ones outside, uh, the PREF versus no PREF is a big issue. The, uh, the acquisition fee versus no acquisition fee, or how big is that acquisition fee? Uh, one of my big bugaboos is, oh, we have a disposition fee. And I'm like, excuse any French words that might come out at this point, <laughs> but are you kidding me? You didn't think that we might sell the thing someday? That's a surprise to you? What's the deal here, guy? Anyway, don't like disposition fees. Not happy with acquisition, but disposition, you know, it, Leads, leads take a lot of risk, and I do recognize they take a lot of risk, and they get pretty well remunerated for it. Sometimes they get some extra remuneration, and I tend perhaps to avoid that deal, but you know, it really it, it needs to be what I'm going to get, not what they're going to get that's the important part of that, and so I try to temper my thoughts on this, but sometimes a really good deal comes up, and I'll, I'll hop on it, uh, but yeah, the ones that are outside of Brad's group, I find them harder to read simply because I'm I'm uh, I'm sheltered with with a certain level of information. Sure, makes sense. All right, I want to I want to unpack some of those uh, things that you just talked about. Acquisition fee, what is acceptable to you when you're underwriting? When I'm you're looking at underwriting, lot, I'm a whole lot happier with zero, but one percent is is not an unreasonable thing these days. It has moved to to, to one. I've seen one at two, and I believe I actually saw one at three. I avoided the three, and yeah, probably avoided the two also if I'm not. No, I got into a two. So, you know, two is becoming unfortunately acceptable. So, so number, so 5% is off your radar. Oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're out. Okay. Uh, I are. Let me hit one more. I was at the old Capitol event a few years ago, and, and, you know, a brand deal, we are again sheltered. Most of the brand deals are 80, 20. I've seen a few that are even 15, 85s. Most of the deals outside of Brad are 70, 30s. And, and that's okay. You know, and some of those okay. have prefs. Typically the brand deals don't have prefs. But one fellow I met at your, at your old capital, he was, uh, hey, I give 50% to my investors as I slowly back up saying that's really cool. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Interesting. All right. That, you know, I don't see that. So that's interesting. IRR. Now, these are going to be probably changing uh, as we're going into a new environment. Um, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts on IRR um, currently? And what do you see that happening as we go into this a little bit more challenging time? Well, I mean, I'm going to start watching the, the deals and I'm going to see the IRRs that they're going to tell me they're going to get. And so I, I think of the, you know, the offer IRR versus the, the post um, mortem IRR. Uh, 
in the early years, it really was not great. Um, let me get to sold. If I look at my solds, uh, you know, I had some 20s. I actually won, I had a 45 that was pretty good. And then we hit a 79% uh, IRR, which is just the highest one I've ever seen. I never expect to see one again. And then we had a, a, you know, a 16, and then it was a 29, a 58, a 36, and that takes me through 18. So there was a really, oh, and a 39 also that took me into 19. So that was a really good set of years. And then more recently, I've been seeing, uh, I had a string of 14s and 16s and 18s last year with 133. And then uh, this past year we sold, or this year, 22, we sold seven deals this year. And I've seen, let's see if I can do them backwards here. 23, 28, 42. I like the 42. Wow. 12, I don't like the 12. Let me see, what was that one? Oh yeah, that was, my, that was one of my dogs um uh let's see th uh 32 and then there was a 14 as that gets me and I, oh and then one more uh an 18 now the 12 uh, there's one guy i have invested with got to be 10 times and he has done me very well each and every time i've still got two or three deals going with him right now one of which is just astronomical uh but i don't have a final IRR because we didn't sold it but um I have a new rule that if if this particular fellow is not the big dog on the deal, I'm not doing it because this one was one that was co-sponsored by a bigger dog than he was when he did this one. And now he has become a bigger dog. So I'm sticking with him rather than the other dog. And the other guy dog is in all capitals, whereas my guy is lowercase, you know, friendly dog. Oh, that, that's so, amazing. Yeah. Okay. So, now tell me about preferred returns. You said that you, uh, you what's your have, stance on that? I have a friend that just requires them out the wazoo, okay. but I, I, I've not really done all the math that I should do to, to, to prove to myself that a, uh, a pref with a 30-70, a 70-30, is going to be beating a non-pref with an 80-20, you know, but I understand the math on the 80-20, you know, they're, they're going to give me just so much back, and, you know, I take my cut and I run, and, and the numbers that I ran off, those are all, all deals without prefs. So I'm not upset with it, but, um, you know, I, there is something to be said for a deal that goes, doesn't do as well. A pref is a very nice guarantee to the, uh, to the investor. So you, you a would a very nice, a very nice feature to the investor. It's not a guarantee. So are you looking for cash flow immediately? Will you walk no. away? Okay. No. I, I, I feel that now with the current environment and the possibility with the loans, sort of going against us and the uh, cap rate sort of going up a little bit that I probably want to push for more cash flow today than I used to. So in the mm -hmm. future, I'll probably be looking for trying to get a bigger cash flow and possibly less pop at the end. But uh, up until now, it's all just been wealth because I don't eat this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm a very lucky person. I live a charmed life. What about hold time? Are you looking for shorter term, longer term? Honestly, I don't care. The best deal I've got has been uh, running for nine years, 10 years now. Hold on, let me see. Uh, we bought this dude in, where is he? Where is he? Oh, up higher. Let's see. We originally bought it in 12 and we're still holding it. So we've had it for about uh, nine and a half years now. It's eight, eight of 12, August of 12. Um, can I talk numbers? Yeah. Okay. So this particular deal, I put a hundred in at the end of two years, we did a, uh, um, cash out refund. Loan. Oh, supplemental. Okay. Supplemental. Uh, it was an agency deal back then. So we did a supplemental. He hands me back 67. So I got like, and I think in capital and return. So I got 67 in the deal and he'd already really paid me uh, another nine or 10 or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so I'm sitting here with 33 in the deal. And he's now still paying at about the same rate. So my, my cash on cash goes up to about 40, 45. You know, nothing to, nothing to be upset about. We uh, ran at that rate for ballpark uh, four or five years. And then he hands me 240,000. So now I am so, so high. I'm so upside down. I've got no cash on cash because there's no cash. Um, and so, but that's been one of the really cool deals and, you know, ultimately we'll sell the thing and I, my value still is around 600,000 in the deal. 
So I'm like, okay, so I don't mind holding on to a good deal for a long period of time. I don't need the pop. I got gray hair. Younger people, from what I uh, have witnessed, they want to get that cash out of it real quick and roll it over into something else. If it's working, it's working. And, you know, I, I'm just perfectly happy to let it ride at that point. Uh, now, I, I when I first started doing this, I looked at the way we do this, uh, you know, double your money in three to five years and sell in, in the five year period. And I'm like, that's almost like flipping. Yeah, I absolutely. understand it. And it works in most cases. But, you know, sometimes it's almost a pain to go off every three years. Some of them go in 19 yeah. months these days. And I have to go looking for another deal at that point. That's work. It's That's a, a lot of work. For me. No, it really is. I mean, you really do have to consider that. Where are you going next? So that's my question to you. 1031s. Do you, ha, do can't you do find? It. Can't do them. Well, a, if the whole group goes, then oh, you can go. You can. I've seen that happen twice. Uh, no, I've seen it happen once. I've heard about it happening one other time. Okay. And I've never been in a deal that, that really would have done that. I was in a two-person deal at one point. Uh, we were thinking that we might do a 1031 at some point. Un sadly or unfortunately, uh, my partner passed away. He was the, uh, we, it was a syndication. I was just the KP. He was the, the deal sponsor. So I got to learn how you deal with the bank and turn me into the lead, turn mm -hmm. his uh, uh, estate into nothing because they couldn't KP it. They, they were not able to guarantee at that point. Luckily, I now had enough wealth that I could do it. But it was a, you know, yet another fun experience. I say fun in a strange way there, but, you know, an interesting set of events. And I'm off talking to, uh, uh, who are the people in, in uh, uh, Wisconsin? Haggerty, Wizard, uh, uh, anyway, uh, one of it, we got the loan through you guys. And mm -hmm. so it was a very interesting thing. We would have 1031 that one, but, you know, as soon as his estate got into the thing, couldn't 1031 it anymore. So that's been the only real opportunity I had. So with a lot of new investors, a lot of limited people wanting to do not be limited partners, but rather be general partners. Can you talk a little bit about the recapture? Okay, so you're, you've got a, a windfall at the end of your five years or whatever. You're, you're going to go into your next deal. How does that recapture affect uh, you? You're talking about the depreciation piece of it? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me preface this by saying that anybody who is getting into their first deal today will probably not have a huge benefit, if, if any whatsoever, on this uh, depreciation stuff. Bonus depreciation is essentially, this is the last year of 100%, next year's 80. So let's take a, a possible deal. You get into a deal, your first deal right now, you'll get 100% uh, bonus depreciation on the deal, perhaps. That, I've had them run somewhere between uh, 50, 60, up to about 109, I think I got on one deal, which was sort of cool. So you get all this depreciation, and then you're going to go and talk to your CPA, and you're not going to be able to do anything with it unless you already have property. Now, if you sold a house to get into multifamily, you were already in real estate. So I'm not counting you. I'm talking about the guy who walks into real estate for the first time. Uh, I used to think, well, if you sold your Tesla stock to get into this, that would work, but it doesn't. It's a different bucket. And so you can't use it against that either. So what will happen is that depreciation will sit in the bucket and it will last for the three to five years before you sell the property and then you'll get to use it. Just like, well, it will cause you never to have to pay any tax on the um, rental income that they distribute to you. I mean, that'll cover all that. But essentially it will really look pretty much like it never happened in the first place. Um, so, you know, God bless you and don't be oversold by the words depreciation. But if you had that house or if you had that prior property and, you know, I sold six this year so far, looks like I'm going to be up to nine or 10 at this point. Uh, so I've got a huge amount of capital gain. So I'm getting into a new property. Uh, let's say I have 500,000 capital gain or more. Let's call it 500, do math. So if I get into uh, uh, let's see, five more deals and I'm putting in 200 a piece and I'm making, uh, you know, getting 50% bonus depreciation on those things this time, I now have 500,000 of depreciation. So I will have, that will wipe out all of my capital gains. Uh, that's the worst case. And I will pay no, I will have no problem, you know, I'll have no tax income at this point. Write down the number 26469, uh, Internal Revenue Code, uh, it's called Title 26. 
if you read that, it's, uh, let's see, paragraph G is where you want to go. There's some really cool CPA language in there, and this is a gray area. Now, if I end up in Leavenworth, I'd love for all of you to visit me, but my CPA says this works. I've seen a couple other CPAs that I believe in. They say it works. I know a couple of them that say, you can't do that. So let's call it a gray area. But there is a clause in there, and I can read it to you. I can almost quote the thing, but there's really fancy language that makes it hard to really say how it works. In theory, what I can do with that 500000 of bonus depreciation is I can use it against my income. That only happens on the disposition of an asset. It does not happen for a non-real estate professional. Again, non-real estate professional. You talk real estate professional, you got a spouse who's a real estate agent. We're, we're a whole different ballgame. I can go there too if you want to do it. So as a, as a non-real estate professional, I can only do this when I dispose of a property. I now have a ton of uh, depreciation from this year on multiple properties. I then essentially, it goes into the bucket. It all gets stirred up and it goes against my earned income, sort of. And essentially, I end up paying all of my income at capital gains rates instead. So it's like really cool. Um, so it, it, it is really nice. Now, really what I've done is I've just pushed it down the road, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. but I'm older and my down the road is going to be at lower tax rates anyway. So it'll just, it'll sort of uh, fix itself long-term. And so, you know, in the next few years, I'll be looking for um, opportunity zones, uh, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully before they go away in good areas and that way the tax, uh, the benefits of the tax will, will sort of wash itself out. So I will not have capital gains from anything in an opportunity zone. That's my game plan. And by doing this, I have been pulling money and doing Roth conversions. Again, old person. So it has helped me tremendously in that sense. Is that what you were fishing for? That is a fantastic. Yes. Can okay. you restate the title 26, the it number, please? Title 26, uh, section 469, paragraph G. Okay. And if you got a good CPA, get him to read it. If you're doing this stuff, find a real estate CPA. I had, uh, we used a nice lady. We'd been using her for 30 years when we started this stuff. And after two or three, four years, we outgrew her. She had not done a lot of real estate people. She was good at doing tax returns, but real estate is weird. So, uh, yeah. and if you start getting in, if you, if you are foolish enough to do one, and if I offend anybody, I apologize. If you're foolish enough to do a self-directed IRA, you will meet Mr. UDF, uh, UDFI. And Mr. UDFI confuses the hooey out of almost every CPA who doesn't do real estate. And so don't do that. Get you one that knows what they're doing. Gosh, that was so amazing. Great, great information. Um, all right. I, I want to point out that I'm full of it because I got brown eyes. Okay. <laughs> so what do you think about the inflation? What are your thoughts on um, the economy? Are you bullish? Are you staying in? Are you getting out? Are you going to tell me uh, like yeah i am staying in but i am looking for deals uh paul did a really good uh, paul peoples your boss yeah. or your partner whatever you want to call him he did a great presentation and he was suggesting that you really want to move up scale you know instead of doing c's you want to do b's and instead of b's you might want to do, do a's class properties and if you can get fixed rates versus the uh the bridge loans that they're doing today you're probably going to do yourself some good uh, and I, I guess a fixed bridge might not be as bad as a floating bridge, mm -hmm. but it still runs out of time. And if nobody's there to buy this thing, I mean, we're, we are operating in some way on the bigger fool theory. Um, and, and I hate to say it that way because real estate does, has been wonderful to us, but you really got to find someone to buy this thing when, when the, the music stops on your loan. Yeah. And if there's no, if there's no loan to be done now, the loans that are floating, people uh, typically the bridges are you got to buy it down and the price to buy it down is huge today or and i i you know some people put money in the bank and it's a little bit hazardous you know essentially they're rolling the dice saying this thing will be short term and so if you calculate you know what interest time you know interest on time that they're putting in the bank you can sort of say ooh, they got a you know a six month three percent or they've got a one year two percent or something like that you go you know are you willing to take that risk uh anyway if the it is my estimation although you can't get as much loan typically 
that you really want to go agency fixed as the rates are going up. And you really want to go bridge as the rates are going down. And I'm not sure that anybody was seeing that very well because none of the leads were really doing it that way. Again, LP, I don't control it. But you know, if you're talking about your own house, you don't buy an arm when the rates are really low. You, you, you get your arm when the rates are high and if they happen to drop your refi. Uh, so you know, the same thing's sort of true about these properties, but they don't, you know, there's no prepayment on your house. There's a hell of a prepayment on the agency loans. Uh, yeah. And there's usually some prepayment on the bridge loans. So you got to take that into account when you're when you're considering how to do this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, you've got kids. Yep. Tell me, are they, you got two kids. Are you, are they interested in investing? Is this gonna be what they wanna do in their future uh, life like you did? What, where are they at? Well, you know, I'm still an engineer more than anything, but I'm a retired engineer. But yes, what we did, um, one of the things that is helpful is if you're accredited, in other words, you make too much money or you got too much money, we'll call that accredited. Or if you're sophisticated, you know what you're doing. The uh, SEC protects the, the uh, poor and the stupid. So, you know, they don't protect us and they allow us to invest in these things. They don't allow those other people to invest in these things. Well, you know, my kids, they're, they're uh, 31 and 34 right now, I believe it is. And so when we started this thing 10 years ago, they were just getting out of college. And so they weren't, you know, well healed and they weren't really sophisticated yet. Although both of them have been to Brad's classes over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what we did as form an LLC where they were actual partners in the LLC. So they could sort of use my reputation to help them invest. So essentially we would talk over the properties, we would invest using this thing and they would take a cut of the profits and also put some money into the thing. So they were taking a little bit of risk too. And so we've worked through that. Daughter number one is now playing in some um, single family stuff. She, she has you know, moved on to do that. Daughter number two is still working with me in a new LLC. So it has, it has introduced them to property, yes. Mm -hmm. I will say that daughter number one is a really highly compensated um, um, person. She went to B school at Emory and she, has, she makes about twice what I ever made as an employee. So, mm -hmm. uh, and so does her husband. So, you know, I'm not too worried about her anyway. Um, daughter number two, she chose a slightly different path. And so she could probably use the, uh, use the money on this thing. Although she's, you know, she's not a piker by any stretch. She's, she's not out on the street, but you know, she is not rolling in it. Her husband does really well, but she, she's enjoying this too. But you're, you've inspired them. And I think that's um, some of the challenge. Uh, I know for me, and I've spoken about this before, I would bring my kids to our our properties and i'd say oh well it's only going to take us 20 minutes yeah. and three hours later we're still there and they're like i am never gonna do this and uh it's unfortunate because it has been it has been such a great trip for me and and uh, experience so all right last question oh words of wisdom for anybody that's either thinking about getting into passive investing thinking that no i want to do general partnership what is your thoughts okay. what are your wisdom everybody's wisdoms? got to bring something to the party so if if you're uh, if you're thinking about being a gp you're not going to impress me if you've never been an lp and so you know somebody in the group has to have enough chutzpah to get the loan so there's going to be and somebody in the group in the gp area has to have some money either that or got to enlist some kps in the deal but people got to bring something to the party. And if they've never operated a deal before, they, they darn well better have some money or they better have a reputation. You know, they got to have some value. And occasionally you'll see deals where there is, quote, the celebrity sponsor who really, he might have a heck of a Rolodex, but he's not bringing much to the party, in my humble opinion, on operating the place. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. You know, but that, that's, a, that's a piece of it. But a couple of things I tell people when they're doing this stuff is, the, the actual distributions, they are not eating money because you will, you will go hungry. Uh, the, the, the distributions will occasionally stop. They, uh, we had a deal in uh, Ohio. We had two clowns on two cars within the same month slam into two of our buildings. And of course, both of them individually were not above the uh, deductible. 
So we got to pay for those. And guess what? There was no distribution that quarter. So, you know, it happens. We've had a boiler blowout. You know, when they turn the air conditioning on here in Texas and you want it to work, you're going to pay for some air conditioners. I have no idea how many air conditioners I bought in the 63 deals, but I would bet there are hundreds, if not thousands of air conditioners I bought through this 12 year period. Uh, and I know I've bought two or three boilers, but there are just things that go wrong, you know, and they're sort of in the underwriting, but when they happen, you're not going to see a distribution. And by the way, COVID, you know, we, we were running 40 deals through COVID, 35 deals through COVID, something like that. And almost every, well, I don't think any of them continued to pay religiously through the whole thing. Now, one of the deals I'm in is a, is a, uh, office space they have mostly dentists in the building so i'll call it a medical office space although there's a couple of other tenants well because all the dentists got shut down we didn't collect money from them so it even didn't pay for um mm -hmm. i guess it was a quarter maybe it was uh, four months i don't know something in that neighborhood wasn't bad but you know you just can't depend on that distribution to eat you can depend on it for a vacation but i'll be dang that you know don't plan on that being your eating or your, your dinner because it just isn't safe to do that and these things are non-liquid. You, you are not getting your money out. As a matter of fact, you know, we, we make the joke about the bozo who calls up and says, hey, I lost my job. Can you give me my money back? And it's like, no. Uh, but it is, it is the lead's responsibility to really make sure people understand that. Because if you got a bozo on the deal, and, and sadly, there have been a few, and luckily, it didn't come to any big problem. But if he causes a problem, calls the SEC because he can't get his money back, it costs me money. So, you know, when they talk about checking the people to make sure they, they are, you know, their, their suitability, you do want them to do that suitability. And, and you realize when you're making out that suitability form, you're giving him the evidence he needs to prove that you knew what you were doing, even if you didn't, because you lied on it. And so he had justifiable reason to believe that. And you're sunk when you try to sue him for anything. I mean, that's the whole purpose of that form. But it really does say that you don't want to have bozos in your deal. Um, Oh my God, you are so amazing. You've got so many stories. You have so much to share. If okay. somebody wanted to okay. reach out to you, somebody who says, hey, I got this deal. Can you help me vet it? What, oh, how, I, how, how, well, I put my email in there. So, you know, contact okay. your email. Uh, people will often, you know, go LinkedIn. And I, I absolutely, I go to LinkedIn and go, yeah call me up, do the email. I mean, I really am just not a LinkedIn kind of person. So yeah. you know, email, I, I try to respond to everybody via email, but I had a fellow, uh, this was, uh, he was a prior Sumrock student and he had dropped out of Brad's group by that point, but I didn't know that. So he said, Hey, I got this deal over in Fort Worth. It's a really cool deal. You know, the, the guy, and it was never clear who this fellow was. He wasn't really the owner and he wasn't really a real estate. Anyway, he's got this deal, but he's got the pro forma and he's worked out the underwriting and he's gone through it. It's just this wonderful deal. So I look at this thing, he, you know, he, I had to talk him into sending it to me because he was like, you'll steal the deal. I said, look, I never lead. I never lead. So he sends mm -hmm. it to me. And there were like 16 huge problems on this thing. And the one that I can remember every day is there was a 99 year mortgage on this thing. Now, I don't know how many 99-year mortgages you've seen, Julie, but I haven't. And so, you know, if you get a 99-year mortgage, that means your payment is dirt cheap because you're stretching it out so dang long. And so that's how you could make it, make it look like it was going to be a deal that worked. And there were another, you know, 15 items on this thing, all, all jury-rigged in there just to make it look like it paid. My comment was, I think you need to go back to class. There you go. There yes, I, I've looked over many deals. You know, the, today I looked over and it, it wasn't a real deal, but he was just trying to figure out how to present to people. But yeah, I do it quite I, often. I, I would love if there are people in the audience that would be interested in working with you to have you spend some time. Let you know, tell Charles, hey, I, I saw you on Zoom at eight. Hopefully, Charles will be more than happy to sit with you for you know short amount of time again these are all relationships that uh, you know i have with the the people that come to speak so you want to be making sure you're not wasting people's time but you know i think man oh man you have so many stories that are so valuable that you can't get by going and reading a book you can't go and and hear it from a teacher it is just 
those conversations that this stuff comes up. So I want to thank you. It was super valuable to have you here tonight. And I know that our audience got so much out of um, everything you shared. I do appreciate it. And, and hopefully you'll be back. <laughs>